Network Dojo. Before we even get into configurations on ICE, I want to take a video to talk about just the overall process flow of RADIUS-based authentications because it's going to be very important to understand what the moving parts are in RADIUS authentications and what we need to know about and configure. And so before we can get to the configuration part, I want to introduce you to all of the different concepts that we're going to be, our configurations really are going to be supporting overall. So the process for RADIUS is pretty standardized. You know, RADIUS is a standard. And so once you know one RADIUS server, you kind of have a really good foundation for any other RADIUS server you would ever want to use. So if you have a healthy background in ACS, ICE is going to seem oddly familiar to you. Even if the user interface is different, the things that you configured in ACS are the similar types of things that you're going to configure in ICE. In a, even a non-Cisco RADIUS server, free RADIUS, you know, anything else that you have out there, uh, Microsoft, IAS, it's not IAS anymore, NPS maybe. Uh, again, you know, we have the same sort of moving parts, and so you're going to see, oh yeah, that's just like this that I configured on this other server. Yep, absolutely, because RADIUS is a standard, and so there's certain things that every single RADIUS server is going to do. And so, even if you haven't done a whole lot of RADIUS, learning ICE will absolutely help you, even if you use a completely different RADIUS server somewhere else, because again, it really has the same building blocks across the board. And then understanding this process flow is going to help you both from a configuration standpoint as well as a troubleshooting standpoint. Because if you know the process flow, you know all of the different things that need to be configured. And since there's, you know, the list can grow a little bit, it's easy to forget one part. And so if you think about the process flow, you can sort of step through it and think, okay, did I get that configured? Has this been configured already? And you can just sort of work your way through. And that it's just an easy way to have a little cheat sheet in terms of what do I need to configure? Just go through the process flow and you can know, okay, yep, I have, I've already got that configured, so I can skip that. Let's go to the next part and work your way down. And then troubleshooting, you can look through the auth logs and see, okay, how far along the process did we get? Do I see something for authorization? Nope. Well, that might mean we had a problem in authentication. You, know, you can just sort of logically step through things. All right, so the overall ICE server radius process flow. <coughs> Starting off, uh, the first thing that's going to happen is a network device check. So all this kicks off when some device, which would be an authenticator, if we're talking about our, our radius roles, we have three roles, supplicant, authenticator, and authentication server. Authentication server being ICE, the authenticator being the device that talks to ICE. So this would be our 5508 controller. This would be our 3650 switch. This would be our autonomous AP, whatever it's going to be. So some device will send a radius request up to ICE, and this is going to kick off the flow. And so before we even process this, allow the communications to even really get anywhere, we need to validate that authenticator, that network device that's attempting to talk to ICE because we won't let just anyone do it. And so we need to have a pre-configured network device that matches the actual authenticator talking to us. And so we, we have this network device check. Is this a legitimate client? And so what are we doing to, to validate our client? Well, one, we want to look at the source IP address of the race request and match that up to a configured network device. You know, we'll probably have many network devices configured. How do you know which network device an authentication is for? Well, Every network device will have one or more IPs assigned to it. And so we just look at the source IP address of the RADIUS request. If that IP address matches one of our network devices, that's the network device that we use <coughs> to validate against. And so once we have our network device identified, then we do one or two different checks against it. The first we always do is a shared secret check. The authenticator will have a shared secret for the RADIUS server configured. The RADIUS server will have a shared secret for the network device, the authenticator. They need to match. If they don't match, stop right there. Then we have an optional uh, AES key wrap sort of negotiation check process as well. We don't have to turn this on and it's off by default. So if we don't turn on AES key wrap, we just sort of ignore this part. But if it's turned on on both sides, um, we need to make sure that they both want to use AES key wrap and that the keys that they use are also identical on both sides as well. And we have to pass all of these checks. If we don't pass any one of them, or if, if one of these checks fails, we stop. And we don't even get into the authentication part of it. So 
Network device check. We have to have that network device be configured and validated on ICE. And once that passes, then we can actually really begin the authentication in earnest. And so the next step is that we need to assign the authentication to a policy set. And you may not have really heard about policy sets before. We'll get into it in a later video. But a policy set basically is just a container that has both an authentication and an authorization policy in it. And by default, it's not even turned on. And so, um, but if you do turn it on, we assign our authentications to policy sets just based off of matching criteria. So there'll be rules. And it's basically, if it matches this rule, use policy set A. If we match this rule, use policy set B. And then a default policy down here if we don't match an explicit rule. So we'll either match a rule that assigns us to a specific policy set, or we'll hit the default rule and we use the default policy. If policy sets aren't even turned on, which is the default, and probably you'll never turn on policy sets in the actual lab, we just use the default policy. And so this is more often than not just an automatic default policy um, assignment. But I just want to throw it in there because it is a potential thing that we may see. I will talk about policy sets in a later video, but the odds are you probably will never use it. And so just by default, you'll just hit a default policy. But we do need to be assigned to a policy set or the default policy. So once we're there, whatever policy set we're assigned to, which is usually the default policy, it's going to have both an authentication and an authorization policy. And so authentication happens first. And authentication is all about validating credentials. You know, I need to verify that this device is supplying credentials that are correct. And so very often it's a username password, right? We need to validate that the username exists and that the matching pass the password matches. Or maybe it's a Mac lookup and we need to look up the Mac address. You know, maybe it's a certificate and we need to validate the certificate. There's lots of different types of credentials, but that's what we're doing here. Validating accurate credentials that we accept. And so as we go through the authentication process, there's a number of steps to the process here. And so the first thing is <coughs> we have rules. And so we need to match a rule because the rule contains all of the instructions for what happens next. So once we hit a rule based off of some sort of matching conditions. The next thing that's going to happen is a protocol check. The client is going to use some sort of protocol. So if this was an AO2.1x style WLAN, you know, the client might be using PEEP. The client might be using EPTLS. And so we need to make sure that PEEP or EPTLS is actually allowed by the rule. If not, we stop because the client is not using an allowed protocol. Maybe it's not an AO2.1x style WLAN. Maybe it's a MAC filtering. And so we would need to allow you know, host lookups. Maybe it's a web auth. And so we would need to allow, usually by default, PAP ASCII. Every single <coughs> authentication will have some sort of protocol identifying it. That protocol must be allowed, otherwise we stop. And it needs to be allowed by the rule that it matched, because different rules can have different lists of allowed protocols. So once we hit a rule, we need to use a allowed protocol that the rule allows. If the client is using a, an allowed protocol, then we can go to the next step, which is we need to validate the credentials and we need to match <coughs> an identity store rule, which will say where do we look to validate the credentials. Uh, so let's pretend again, 802.1x, let's say that the user did peep and they supplied a username password. We have a, different, a few different places to look to validate usernames and passwords. Maybe it's a local account, maybe it's an Active Directory account, maybe it's an LDAP account. And so we need to know where do we look, and that's what the identity store rule says, where do I look to validate these credentials. And then once I know where I need to look, we look for a matching user account, and if we find it, validate the password. So that's that last step, validate the credentials once you know where to look. And that's really, you know, so a number of steps to really get through that authentication phase. So again, we're trying to validate credentials here. So we match a rule, verify that we're using an allowed protocol based off of the rule, if that's good, then we have the sub rule for matching identity stores. Where do we look to validate credentials? And finally, validate the actual credentials in the uh, specified identity stores. And if we can pass all of that, then we move to the final stage, which is authorization. And authorization is all about determining end results. We can absolutely pass authentication, you know, supply valid credentials, but still be denied from our net from accessing the network based off of the authorization policy in play. And so normally you need both, 
<coughs> to allow you on the network, but just because you pass authentication doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get on the network. That's what authorization says. Now that I know who or what the device is, what do I do with it? That's authorization. So we have a list of rules. We'll match a rule. And the result of a rule is something called an authorization profile. And that's what has the result. You know, maybe it's a simple permit or maybe it's a simple deny. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's uh, allow them, uh, but put them on VLAN 112. Maybe it's assign this ACL. Maybe it's initiate the central web auth redirect process. You know, there's lots of different end results, but that's what we're specifying here is what is the end result. And then we send back that result to the authenticator and the process is done. And so at this point, either the, the client's either up and running on the network or it's been denied from the network, whatever the end result specified. So that's the overall radius process flow. And if you haven't done a whole lot of radius work, a lot of this is probably flying by you a little bit. We're gonna be going into the individual configs of all of these. And so we're, gonna, we're sort of forced into showing you the pieces, the building blocks of the overall policy and then we'll actually show you everything working. And so we're gonna be spending a number of videos really building up to a fully completed policy. And at that point, then we actually watch things work. And so again, if a lot of this is new to you, you're gonna to have to really bear with me in terms of you know, just trying to zero in on the building blocks. And then once you see it actually in play, and I'll, I'll be stepping through this as, I, as much as I can, it'll start to make more and more sense. But all of it really, stems from you know this flow and so if you can write down this process flow and just sort of see that okay these are the the steps that radius is going to take and so as we go through the configurations you know we can reference okay well this is to support this step of the process and so you can understand okay when i'm configuring this i'm configuring things that are needed for the network device check or when I configure this, I'm configuring things that are needed for the authentication policy or whatever it's going to be. That'll help you, you know, having this all sort of mapped out and listed as a reference sheet. And then once we're done, we'll look at auth logs and we'll be able to see, okay, yep, here's where we can verify this is the network device it matched. Here's where we can see this is the authentication rule that was processed. This is the EAP type it was used. And, and this is where we found the credentials. And here's the authorization rule that we hit and the policy that was applied. And it's gonna to start to make more and more sense the more you see it actually in play. But it's gonna take a little bit of build up talking about the individual components before we can really show you the fully uh, working thing, at least have it make sense to you. So you might have to go through these videos a few times, um, play around with it a lot. But once you get it locked in, um, it really makes sense and you can you know, start to be you know, doing whatever it is that you want. You can sort of improvise and come up with solutions to problems because you know all the moving parts and now it's just a matter of, okay, how do I get from A to B? And you lead yourself through the process here. And so that's the normal radius flow, but there's another thing I wanna talk about called change of authorization, which is uh, a new thing that we haven't had to deal with um, in prior versions of the lab. So change, change of authorization, or COA for short. Now, normally all radius communications are initiated by the authenticator. So you know, client connects up to a WLAN, the authenticator reaches out to the radius server to begin an AO2.1x authentication for the client. So it's always initiated by the authenticator because the authentication, authenticator has the trigger events, right? The client connects, someone logs into the management interface, whatever it is. And so it doesn't make sense that the radius server would initiate any of this, right? Well, change of authorization allows us to actually have the radius server initiate an action, but this only really applies after we have an existing session. So after a client has already authenticated and is up on the network, now we could do a change of authorization on that client. And so really all a change of authorization is, is the radius server asking the authenticator to do a fresh authentication for an existing client. Now, why would you wanna do this? Well, there's a couple of primary use cases that we have. Central web auth is, is a big one that we would use change of authorization for. Client profiling is something we'd use change of authorization for, but why do we use it? Well, that second to last bullet point, <coughs> excuse me, it's normally done when the radius server wants to basically return a different result than it originally did. 
Why would that ever happen? So let's take the case of profiling. Profiling, which we'll have a, you know, some videos on uh, later, is all about you know, trying to identify what is something. Is this, an, is this an iPad? Is it an Android device? Is it a Windows device? Whatever. And then once we know what it is, we might apply some sort of policy. You know, so you know what? All smartphones should get put on VLAN 112. Okay, that, that might be your policy. Smartphones, place them on VLAN 112. Well, the first time a client connects up to our network, we don't know that it's a smartphone yet. But once it is on our network, we can look at information, we can talk to it, we can gather this information needed to see that, oh, well, this is actually a smartphone. So to begin with, it didn't hit the smartphone rule, it just hit some more generic rule, and so it was on a completely different VLAN than what we want it to. But now that we know it's a smartphone, we want to move it somewhere else, but we can't as the radius server because the only thing we can do by default is respond to new authentications. And so until this smartphone does a new authentication, it stays on the VLAN it was originally placed on, but that's not where we want it. With change of authorization, the radio server can be like, oh, well, it's a smartphone, which means I probably want to put it somewhere else. So you know what? Change of authorization. The authenticator just doesn't request a new authentication, which sends a new one up, and at that time we hit a different rule, and we can place them on the appropriate VLAN. And so basically, ICE has learned some new piece of information that would generally give us a different result if the client would authenticate again. And so rather than wait for a natural reauthentication, we can initiate a new authentication through a change of authorization request and then speed up the process to get that new result. That's really what change of authorization is intended for. We learn some new piece of information that would result in a different, um, that would cause a different end result. And rather than wait, we immediately ask for the new auth, getting an immediate new end result. And the client needs, uh, the authenticator, sorry, needs to support this. Otherwise, normally it would ignore these change of authorization requests, but absolutely all of our wireless, at least sorry, our, our 5508s and our iOS XE based devices absolutely support change of authorization. And you know, with these last two examples, central web auth and client profiling are sort of vitally important aspects of those technologies. So absolutely, We'll be using change of authorization. On the ICE side, there's very little to do in terms of needing to turn this on or anything like that. We'll see the policies that we need to configure on ICE, but the important part is to make sure that our authenticators are configured to honor those change of authorization requests. And we should have talked about those when we talked about configuring RADIUS servers on AirOS devices or configuring RADIUS on our iOS XE devices. And so we should have given you that piece of the puzzle. In this series, we'll kind of show you why we're sending the COA requests and how they build into our policies. So it's a new feature. It's related to RADIUS. It's not a normal part of the authentication flow. It's just these extra things that we can do to ask for a new auth. And when we get, you know, once we actually trigger the new authentication, then we just go th through a new radius process flow. So network device check, policy set, authentication, authorization. And so it just triggers just a new flow at that point is really what the this end result is. So there's change of authorization. Um, I'll be referencing it as we go through some of these other videos, but there's really not a whole lot of ICE configuration uh, surrounding, but I want to make sure that you at least understand what that was.